everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kate and I am a part-time English literature student at the University of Oxford and a full-time Google employee. A lot of people have requested this video and I'm really excited to talk about it. I have so many books to the side that you can't see, but I'm very excited to talk about the books that I have read as a part of my part-time English literature course at the University of Oxford. For those that don't know, I am doing a part-time English literature course at the University of Oxford through the Continuing Education Department. And this course is kind of a intensive literature course that covers a vast array of periods and literary critical approaches and the history of the English language. So there's two years, it consists of three terms per year, as well as a summer school in between the two years. I have absolutely loved doing this course. It is so incredible. I finish up in June with my last set of exams before I go on to study my master's in English literature at the University of Oxford. And I, will forever be grateful for this course, for the continuing education department at Oxford University. Not many people know about it and it's such a shame because it is truly such a fantastic place. It has such a wide array of courses, it has such a wide array of information and makes education accessible to those of us who are working or who need to be part-time and it's just amazing. So yeah, let's dive in. So in your first year, as I said, you've got three terms. Each term you cover a different section of work. So in the first term, your Michaelmas term, you are, we are looking at approaches to language and literature. This term is very theoretical. You're looking at a lot of literary texts in terms of approaches, how critical analysis is conducted, type of narrative techniques, difference, differences between poetry and prose, but very, very in depth and very, very theoretical. So a lot of the time for these, for these terms, you have two of these, you have uh, one in your first year uh, at your Michaelmas term, and then one in your second year at your Michaelmas term, both varying levels of approaches. So I don't have much in terms of books that I looked at. The one book that we really focused in on, which I would highly, highly recommend if you are interested in getting into literature and focusing in on it in more detail. Let me just see if I can find it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I can't seem to find it, but I remember it was called Bennett and Royal. I'll put a little uh, picture up of the book that we looked at a lot. This was such a great book for introduction into critical theory, into thinking about literature in a more critical manner. And we also explored theorists like F.R. Leavis and a whole load of really interesting approaches to analyzing analyzing literature and analyzing literary criticism. So one thing I did find at my secondhand bookstore was David Lodge's Modern Chris Criticism and Theory. I cannot tell you how many times I've dived into this book. Essentially, it's just got a whole lot of critical essays from various literary critics and anyone who studied literature will know Derrida, Roland Barthes, uh, Michel Foucault, Julia Kristeva, um, Edward Said, Terry Engleton, um, yeah, Umberto Eco. There is so many essays in here that have been really, really helpful in helping me to kind of analyze literary texts in very particular manners. 
I know this video is gonna be really long, so we're gonna try to breeze through this as much as possible. A couple of the other books that I ended up reading during this, during this semester was Paul Gilroy's The Black Atlantic. We discussed aspects of this book during our uh, colonialism week and I found this such a fascinating read so I actually got hold of the book. Uh, the Black Atlantic, Mod Modernity and Double Consciousness, I found this really really fascinating and I think it's such an interesting read to look at the idea of spatial disparity so yeah, I realize I can't go on about this for every book. One of the other books that I got was Edward Said's Orientalism. Any literary student or any um, culturalist student knows who Edward Said is. He is the brain behind the idea of Orientalism and looking at culture through an Oriental lens. It's really fascinating. I've I haven't read the whole thing, I'll admit, but I have picked up certain aspects of it. You can see I've got little tabs in here. So I have found this really helpful to have that book on board. When we were discussing different forms of writing, we actually looked at this little play, Salt by Selena Thompson. You guys, I, I cannot sell this enough. This little play is the most incredible thing I think I've ever read. I know if you go on to BBC, you can get hold of a recorded version of when she performed this play herself. It is absolutely fantastic and it ties in really nicely with this idea of double consciousness. So during the summer school, when I took the modern uh, the World Literature Seminar at the English Literature Summer School. This is what I ended up writing on, is a critical view of this as it applies to Salt by Selena Thompson. And that was the essay that I submitted to Oxford for my master's. So hopefully it actually did go quite well. So that is the first semester that we have. It is just critical approach. It is just looking at theory. It's very intense, very exciting, but we only sort of touch on segments of prose and poetry. We don't go into anything really intense in terms of whole literary review of books. I'm just going to, because I have a lot here, I'm going to put these on the floor. Oh, I don't like putting books on the floor. And just make some space here because we have, we have a lot of books to talk about. <laughs> Look at that. We have a lot of books to talk about in the next semester. Right, so our next semester is Victorian literature in Hillary term. This is a deep dive into Victorian literature. Literature that was written during the reign of Queen Victoria. And it talks a lot about sort of the societal values that were held by Victorians at this time. There is a lot of conservatism, but there's also a lot of interesting developments that are happening. Industrial revolution is starting to gain its sort of force. Women are starting to write. Uh, you have the introduction of the Brontes and Jane Austen and all that kind of thing. And it's really fascinating. But beyond that, there is a lot of writing that is happening outside of England that is impacted by what is going on with English imperialism at the time and English industrialism. So having said that, the first week we dived into class, gender and ethnicity and we looked at some slave narratives which were absolutely fascinating. So we looked at, a co I don't have physical copies of these books, unfortunately, I couldn't get my hands on them. So I read them on my Kindle, but I will put pictures up here. So we read the history of Mary Prince, a West Indian slave, the wonderful adventures of Mary Seacole in many lands. And we are often encouraged during this, during these, semesters to 
read broader than the reading list. So I've got a couple of books in here that were not on the reading list themselves, but which I read in addition to reading the reading lists. And you're allowed to write in those books in the exam. It's actually encouraged. You get a greater mark if you read beyond the reading list. So I also read, oh, I can't, I can't remember. I think I read two other slave narratives and my brain is gone. I cannot think of them. I will put the names here that I read, but I was absolutely fascinated by this. So as I said, I don't have the actual copies of the narratives that I got hold of, but I got hold of this really gorgeous book, In Search of Mary Seacole by Helen Rip Rapatel. Um And I found this when I was in Oxford for the summer school and it's signed. You guys, I am just, I'm so excited. Okay. Um, Helen Rappaport, sorry, Helen Rappaport. She is a historian. Anyway, she did a deep dive into Mary Seacole and I've read parts of this book as I, I haven't read the full thing, but I've read parts of it. I found it absolutely fascinating. I can't wait to read the rest of it. I was blown away by these narratives and just the fact that they exist is something so incredible. So I don't know where to put these books because I'm running out of space. <laughs> okay. No, oh, no, that's not going to work. Let's put them there. So that was the slave narratives that we talked about. The next book that was a required reading was Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Just to preface, we are told what versions of books to get, but it is not compulsory for you to get a particular version. I absolutely love these Penguin English Library versions. I have like a whole, well, a lot of them have been pulled out for <laughs> this video. So they've all kind of fallen over, but I've got a whole section here that's just Penguin English Library uh, copies. And I had a lot of these books anyway, so I wasn't going to go out and buy new versions just because I was told to do so. So anyway, um, we read The Heart of Darkness from Joseph Conrad. I had such an interesting experience with this book because I read this when I was a teenager. Absolutely hated it. I dreaded rereading Heart of Darkness because I read it as a teenager and I hated it. But I reread it. I loved it. I thought it was so fascinating. Such an interesting take on Victorian literature and colonial expansion. And it was just the amount of parallels in there is just fascinating. I could go on talking about these books. Actually, that's a great question. Let me know in the comments down below if you would like me to do smaller short form videos where I talk about each of these books in detail. Let me know. Um, the next round of books that we looked at was around the Victorian social, uh, the Victorian social problem novel and the condition of England and who better than Charles Dickens. So we were told to read Oliver Twist. Interesting choice, in my opinion. I don't know why we read Oliver Twist, but it was great. I'd never read it before, obviously knew the story of Oliver Twist, but never actually read the book itself. Again, I'm collecting these Penguin hardback editions of Charles Dickens's novels. So I have this, I have... I have David Copperfield, I have a Christmas Carol, and yeah, I'm slowly collecting these editions. I think they're so great. They've got little illustrations in them as well, which is really fascinating. I really enjoyed this book. I did not think, I did not think there was going to be so much to it, but it's really interesting to look at the condition of England at the time, the social problems that exist at the time. Um, in addition to Oliver Twist, I read Great Expectations. This was a copy that my family had in their library, which I then acquired and took hold of. But I actually have two copies of Great Expectations. I have 
this copy of Great Expectations, which is the one that I use to read the most. And then I have this beautiful penguin drop case copy of Great Expectations. But I thought this was really, really great. I really enjoyed reading this book. I thought it was really fascinating and it was a great way to kind of compare these two in essays. So yeah, very thrilled that I read that. Okay, moving on, moving on, moving on. We are looking at post-Gothic imagination, symbolism to sensation. And our recommended reading was Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. As you can see, I tabbed this book a lot. This is my working copy of Jane Eyre. I again have another fancy version of it here in the Penguin Drop Case. And this book I could talk about for ages. The layers in this book are absolutely incredible. And if you haven't read it, if you've only seen the film, please go and read this book. I, I, I can't say enough good things about this book. It is really, really fantastic. I read a couple of other Brontes while we were reading those. So I read The Tenant of Widefell Hall, again in the Penguin English Library edition. So pretty. Um, and I read Lady Audley's Secret by Mary Elizabeth Brandon. This book was surprisingly entertaining. If you like anything about like true crime or crime novels or things like that, and you kind of want a touch of it in Victorian literature, this is the book that you need to read. It was so good. I loved this book. I wrote an essay on it. I thought it was so exciting. And it really is, you know, this is the era where you start to see women writers really exploring themes that are not wholly appropriate. It's, it's really fascinating. Anyway, I could talk about this for ages. I'm not going to because we don't have time. So moving swiftly along we've got later Victorian realism um, particularly George Eliot and our recommended reading was The Mill on the Floss. This book destroyed me. I thought it was great. I loved discussing it. I loved reading it. I hated the ending with every fiber of my being. It really, it just, it made me so unhappy. It made me so unhappy. If you know what happens at the end, you'll know why this made me so unhappy. I thought that the writing was really great. I was really engaged with it. I want to read more George Eliot. I haven't. I would love to dive into it a bit more. I have Middle March again in the Penguin Drop Caps collection. I need to read it. It's on the, the, the list to read. If you have any other George Eliot recommendations, please do let me know. In addition to Mill on the Floss, I read a couple of years ago, I read, I read Tess of the D'Urbervilles. This, this book, this book has a lot of issues. I, I love Thomas Hardy's writing. Let me just say, the man had a way with words. It was really fantastic. But, whoo, this book, this book. Oh, actually, I read something else that I forgot to mention. And it's here in my, oh gosh, these bookshelves are going to fall apart without being fully stacked. I also read Far From the Manning Crowd, which I... I got this version secondhand, as you can see, it's a bit sun damaged, but I really, really like this book. I know it's not one of his like more famous works. Um, and it's definitely doesn't have sort of the literary craft that you would see in Tess the D'Urbervilles, but this book just was so great to read. I really loved this book. I'm thrilled that I read it. 
and yeah okay so now we're moving away from prose work we're moving into Victorian poetry and Victorian verse and for that we were recommended we get this anthology the new Oxford book of Victorian verse and by Christopher Ricks or uh, edited by Christopher Ricks and this anthology is really fascinating. We looked at poets like Alfred Lord Tennyson, Robert Browning, Christina Rossetti, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, um, and Gerald Manny Hop Hopkins. I was really intrigued by Victorian poetry, particularly Victorian woman poets, so Christina Rossetti and Elizabeth Barrett Browning there was just such an interesting way in which they played with the form of Victorian writing. I mean, if you can imagine this era being very sort of conformity driven, there was a lot of experimentation in poetry, which was just so exciting. So, so exciting. I did not think that I would get as much enjoyment out of Victorian poetry as I did. I should also preface that I'm not a poetry person. I am definitely more of a prose person. Poetry is great. I can acknowledge that it's really incredible. And if you write poetry, I admire you so, so much. I could never do it. But there was something in here. There was a lot in here. And obviously this has got a lot more poets in it than just those ones that I mentioned. And we definitely didn't even, we didn't even touch sides with the amount of poems in here. But it was really fascinating. I'm glad I have this anthology so that I can dive into it a bit more at a later stage. We are still going with Victorian literature, you guys. We are almost done, but we are very... We're nearing the section that I love the most and the section that I read the most in. So, our final section that we looked at was Victorian anxieties. And this kind of really spoke about ideas of queerness, gender, sexuality, and mental anxieties. So, the required reading was one of my favorite books of all time one that i i mentioned in my video what books led me to studying english literature i will put that link up so you can have a look at that video this is the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde again in these beautiful english library versions this book i think i've said enough about it in the previous video if you want a little bit more go over there but really this book opened up a doorway for me I mentioned this in the other video I'm not going to say it again I'm repeating myself we've already got so much to do and we're only on term two and we're already like half an hour in on this video too too far um but I ended up reading really widely in this area in de fin, the fin de cercle um, sort of genre of Victorian literature. I read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Jekyll, Jekyll, however you want to say it. We've had this American Eng uh, English debate between me and the other accepted girls a lot. Sometimes I win, sometimes they win. I'm just going to say, I say, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. Guys, this book is so great. Parallels, all kinds of parallels, double consciousness, health anxiety, mental health anxiety, exploration of gender, exploration of stereotypes. This tiny little book does it all. It's incredible. There is so much in here that you can explore. So, putting it out there. I also read Dracula by Bram Stoker. This book was really good. I 
thought the idea of otherness was really fascinating. Again, the gendered sort of stereotypes that existed in the space, the breaking of that, the kind of idea of a gothic sort of villainous othering um, is is really, really brilliant. Again, I can go into this into a thousand different ways. I also read Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. This book, <laughs> incredible. Frankenstein is really such a fascinating, such a fascinating read. You think you know the story because you've heard of Frankenstein. The amount of layers in this book Mary Shelley is just, she is so incredible. I wish we had so much more by her, but she is just, she's fascinating. And it, it's appropriate that I end sort of the Victorian literature piece with her because one of the books that I read in addition, I mean, I read a lot of these in addition, but one of the sort of critical books that I read in addition to all of this because I really was fascinated by the idea of gender in these kind of stories was Mary Wollstonecraft's A Vindication of the Rights of Women. For those that don't know, Mary Wollstonecraft is Mary Shelley's mother. She was a writer, she wrote about female rights in a society where women didn't really have many rights and she writes this manifesto basically arguing for female rights in the most brilliant, brilliant, brilliant manner. So I use this a lot in some of my critical essays. I kind of dipped in and out of this book. I haven't read the whole thing, but it's it's really, really great. There's a little quote here that says, the first great piece of feminist writing. Absolutely. Whew. Gathering my breath. That was Victorian literature. That was one, that was one term. That was the Hillary term. I read in total during that term, one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen books in ten weeks. That is what studying literature gets you. Very exciting. That was the longest time. Okay. Well, the longest book list. So Trinity term of first year, it's our last term. We are looking at early modern poetry. Early modern period kind of starts off in the 15th century and works its way through to the <coughs> Age of Enlightenment around sort of the 17th, 18th century. In this semester, we <coughs> looked at poetry across this period. It's such a period you guys I did not think I was going to be interested in it at all it's kind of it's also called the renaissance period just FYI there's sort of debates whether it should be properly termed yeah. renaissance versus early modern period but we refer to it as the early modern period in this course and that's what we will continue to refer to it throughout the this video. Sorry, <laughs> dogs have just come into my office. So if you hear noises in the background, you know why. So kicking off, we looked at the writing of Sir Philip Sidney um, in the major works. We focused primarily on his poem, Astrophil and Stella. Really, really fascinating poem. But we also actually looked at a lot of his critical writing as well. Um, and some of... I'm sorry, but he's licking the door. I don't know why. What are you doing, darling? Anyway, so this this was really, really fascinating. I, I thought that Philip Sidney... 
I didn't love him. I have to admit, Astrophil and Stella was really great. I enjoyed reading it, but I did not love his writing. I don't know. Eh. It still kind of pops up in my in my head every now and again, the things that he spoke about and the way he described them. I thought it was really interesting, but it just, I don't know. Anyway, we had a couple of weeks on that. I think we had two weeks on Philip Sidney. And then, guys, the beast of a poem Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one poem. There's the poem in double columns with the notes below. Agreed, Millie. This, <laughs> this is insane. This book, well, this poem Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen. It is actually an incredibly fascinating read. And I have to admit, I haven't read all of the poem. I think there's something like 12 books in, sorry, seven books. There's seven books in here. I have read bits of the books. I have mainly read book one and two. I have not really read too much of the other books, but I just found this absolutely fascinating. So a little bit of background to Spencer's The Fairy Queen. This was actually written, Edmund Spencer wrote this to gain his patronage with Queen Elizabeth the first so it's got a lot of sort of allusions to the fairy queen and her kingdom it's really fascinating the amount that kind of you can dive into this when you look at like the knights where you look at the villains that they fight when you look at the challenges that they encounter as they kind of go through the journey of the fairy queen really fascinating and this edition that I have is really helpful it's got a lot of explanatory notes it's not annotated but it does have a lot of explanatory notes and it's also got a couple of Spencer's um, sort of notes uh, his letters a little bit of commentary and uh, a really sort of detailed introduction of Spencer's life and the different books, which I have found very, very fascinating. Very, very <laughs> long couple of weeks engaging with that book. We then moved on to, I suppose, what we would term sort of still early modern poets, but we kind of went into religious poetry a little bit which was really interesting so we looked at Don John and George Herbert in the last couple of weeks so I didn't buy the recommended version of John Don's songs and sonnets um, because I found this gorgeous little copy from <laughs> way back when, um, when it cost one shilling and six pence for <laughs> John Donne's poetry. I just thought this was so cute, you guys. This is from Penguin Books. Um, and it was published in 1950. That is so cute. Anyway, so I found this little version of the poems this is the one I kind of worked with when I was reading the poems myself, but I obviously was able to get online and look at annotated versions as well to divulge into the poems. But I love John Donne's poems. This was my favorite section. I thought he was so clever. He was so sort of 
challenging. It was incredible. I really enjoyed studying him. We then looked at the English poems of George Herbert. These were very religious focused poems. They were fascinating to study and I did get his auto or the most recent book about him like a biography about George Herbert from the library. I started reading it and then it was exam time and then I ran out of time before I had to return the book. So I didn't finish it. I'll put a little picture of that up here. But I really enjoyed this period of studying. Early modern literature was really quite fascinating to me. Something that I wanted to dive into a bit more. So I did a bit more research and that's kind of where I would like to focus my research going forward. So yeah, anyway, so that was the end of year one. We made it. Oh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm even tired. This is a lot of speaking. A lot of recollection. It's really fun. 